navigating the stage. <laughs> Turn these microphones up a little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, honoured guests, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the last of today's festival sessions, and one that will, I am sure, be an utterly riveting uh, discussion, focusing as it does on the complexities of the human condition. <laughs> Bill Nicholson is a British screenwriter, playwright and novelist who has twice been nominated for an Oscar. Bill started out at the BBC as a director of documentary films with numerous works to his credit before gaining renown as a novelist and playwright when the first book of his popular Wind on Fire trilogy won the Blue Peter Best Book Award and the Smarties Gold Award for Best Children's Book. <laughs> He's also written... A clearly a polymath. He has also written several novels and fantasy books. Twice nominated for Tony Awards for Best Play, for Shadowlands and The Retreat from Moscow, he later turned Shadowlands, based on the relationship, as you will know, between C.S. Lewis and Joy Gresham, into a BBC TV play and later an acclaimed film. The latter starred Anthony Hopkins and Deborah Winger and was directed by Richard Attenborough. Lord Attenborough. He later worked as a writer on the Academy Award-winning epic Gladiator and wrote and directed the 1997 film Firelight. Amongst Bill's many, many screenwriting credits are Gladiator, Elizabeth the Golden Age, the global phenomenon that is Les Miserables, and the forthcoming film Mandela, based of which you'll be hearing much in the coming year, based on The Long Walk to Freedom. His latest novel, Motherland, has been described by Claire Clark in The Guardian as a profound and moving novel, a tender and compassionate meditation on love and God and duty and how to be good. Rupert Christensen was born in London into a well-known journalistic family, attending King's College, Cambridge, and Columbia University as a Fulbright scholar. After academic research in American literature and a spell at Oxford University of Press, he attempted to become a theatrical agent before turning to full-time writing in 1982. <laughs> he has since published 12 books, including Prima Donna, Romantic Affinities, which won the Somerset Maugham Prize, Paris Babylon, The Visitors, Arthur Hugh Clough, and The Complete Book of Aunts. Most recently, he has completed a study of Dickens' novel Great Expectations. His career as a journalist has included periods as arts editor of Harper's and Queen, deputy arts editor of The Observer, and regular contributions to The Spectator, Times, Times Literary Supplement, and Vanity Fair. He has been opera critic and arts writer at The Daily Telegraph since 1996 and dance critic of The Mail on Sunday since 95. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 1997 and he sits on the boards of the Gate Theatre and Opera magazine and is, of course, as many of you will know, an emeritus trustee at Charleston. His memoir entitled I Know You're Going to Be Happy explores the departure of his father from the family home and his relationship with his mother and has been described by The Guardian as poignant and compelling and a compulsive read of a book. So, as we dive into this evening's fascinating exploration of two stories focusing on the mother-child relationship, please do join me in offering a very warm Charleston welcome to Bill Nicholson and Rupert Christensen. Uh, thank you very much, Alistair. But what you didn't mention was the most interesting thing of all, which is that uh, I used to be Bill's lodger. But that's another story, um, <laughs> and a very long one. Um, I, I feel a certain embarrassment standing before you today, and I, I wonder if um, many people in the audience have had that awful dream of sort of walking down the street with no clothes on, just like this. Um, and that's rather how I feel, having written a memoir. And it's not altogether rational, this feeling, because it, I'm only a very secondary character in this book. It's really about my, it's about my parents, and they are long dead. And in brief, um, uh, they were born in the mid-1920s, um, and they both became journalists after the war. Uh, my mother came from a very unremarkable background, but was uh, a sort of grammar school girl, and very ambitious, and she got onto the Daily Mail when she was 18 as a news reporter in 1944. 
and reported on the V2s, and among other things. Uh, my father um, came from a very well-known journalistic family, as uh, Alistair mentioned. His father was editor of the Daily Express um, at a time when it was the uh, highest-selling newspaper in the country, and he, he, he was a sort of celebrity. And I think one of the problems my father had is that he went into the same profession. He also joined the Daily Mail and was desperate, I think, uh, all through his life to be as good, if not better, than his father. Um, my parents married in 1947, and it was a, a great love match, I think. And they were young. They were both up-and-coming young people uh, in the public eye, and um, all looked well um, and boded well for a, a happy marriage. I came along about seven years later, uh, partly because my mother uh, suffered from TB and was sort of out of action for a couple of years. And then my sister was born in 1958. And then suddenly, um, my father announced, and my mother always said it was complete bolt from the blue, uh, that, he was, that he was leaving her and that he'd fallen in love with his secretary. Uh, and that was that. Um, and basically, she never recovered from this. And uh, I never saw him again. And I was aged four at this point, and my sister was um, a few months old. My father went on to become the editor of the Daily Mirror. Um, for a few years, he'd occasionally send us presents, but I basically had no further contact with him for the rest of his life. Um, so it's a, a very, very painful subject for me to address, and one that I've sort of suppressed all my life, and I don't really like talking about myself and my, my own emotions, so it's all very, very raw. So why did I write it? You might well ask. Um, and I'm afraid the immediate sort of superficial answer is the venal one, which is that my agent, I think, was about to fire me if I didn't <laughs> just come up with an idea. I couldn't think of anything else to write, really. And she knew, she knew something of this story. And she said, well, you know, why don't you write about your family? And I said, well, God, you know, who on earth is going to be interested in that? And she said, no, people really are interested in this sort of thing. You know, these sort of memoirs are of enormous interest to people, and they feel they can identify with them. And then there were two other reasons things which encouraged me. One is that um, my father died in about 1984, but um, a cousin of mine, about seven or eight years ago, sent me a great stash of letters that he had written uh, home to his father during the war. My father um, was evacuated um, to America in 1940 because my grandfather was on Hitler's blacklist. Um, and therefore the whole family was sent off to America. And he wrote these astonishing letters. And I felt for the first time that I heard my father's voice. And suddenly I became interested in him uh, and felt um, in his presence, if you like, in a way that I had never done uh, before that. And the second thing is, um, I expect many people in the audience um, are fans of the series Mad Men. Yes? On television, yes, some people. And you will know who I mean by Don Draper, who is the rather sort of alluring, charismatic advertising agent. And this series was all set in the early 1960s. And Don Draper, I became a great fan of Mad Men, and Don Draper um, reminded me forcibly of a man that my mother had a, a, a very intense and passionate love affair with in the 1960s. He was an American lawyer who was spending a lot of time in, in London. And I thought, actually, that would be something rather fascinating to write about, too. But basically, the core of the book is about what it was like to be a woman stuck in the suburbs in the early 1960s with two very small children. And um, I'd like to read just two very short extracts from my book to give you a, a taste of this. We lived in a, a, a Kent suburb, a sort of very pleasant garden suburb called Pets Wood, but it was really not a very nice place at all. Pets Wood 
was profoundly and incurably invested by an invisible skein of class markers proliferating like malignant cells. The road you lived in, the food you ate, the clothes you wore, whether you pursed your lips for prunes and prism, whether you went to the toilet or nipped to the loo, all these signified, as they did throughout the country, at a time when the game of you and non-you, published by Nancy Mitford, was a major cultural phenomenon, both an anxiety and a joke. To imagine a system enclosing this would, I think, be misleading, inasmuch as there wasn't a grid that you could navigate or a ladder you could scale. Class didn't bludgeon or brand you. There wasn't a badge on your breast or a flash on your or shoulder. It was just something in the air, like an ectoplasm or virus, something you could never quite put your finger on, and certainly not something that could be precisely engineered or controlled or quantified. Breeding was an important word hereabouts too. Now altogether archaic, and even then spoken in, in slightly hushed, masonic tones, and used not in a strictly reproductive uh, sense, but in relation to etiquette, comportment, and dialect, as well as some sort of ultimate moral caliber. Good breeding, the mark of our pets would, or so it liked to think, was a debased version of what Chaucer's knight would have called gentillesse and the Victorian's gentlemanliness. There are some things that a person with this X factor would just never do, and that included mentioning the toilet. <laughs> My mother was divorced, and I think that's, it's very, very difficult, sort of 50 years on, for people to r realize what a, a, a brand that was on a woman, even though she was entirely the innocent party in, in the divorce. Um, and how she fell victim to an awful lot of uh, petty snobbery and um, s snubs, really, daily snubs, which ruined her confidence, really, for the, for the rest of her life. There was no yellow star or scarlet letter attached to my mother's divorce. She wasn't shunned or excluded, just subtly degraded, looked at, talked about, pitted from a distance, and by tacit agreement marked down as a danger area. Only occasionally did anyone overtly remind her of her failure to meet the requirements for full club membership. After the divorce, for instance, the unspeakably stupid vicar came round to commiserate and let slip that, of course, while she would be welcome at the church, the view of the diocesan bishop, blah, 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 was that she could not take communion or belong to the mother's union. My mother's Christianity was largely superstitious, but after this she would never step foot in that church again. And even now, when its attitudes have changed radically, I'm not sure I can forgive the Church of England for its unchrist-like crassness. The school run was the candidate for gossip, an intimate environment where parents subtly interrogated their defenseless passengers and coaxed us innocent children into the unwitting betrayal of confidences and the exposure of concealed truths. I hear your mother is playing the guitar said Mrs. Hinton one day. There was the hint of a curled lip in her tone, <laughs> implying that this was just the sort of ridiculous stunt that could be expected of such a wayward person as my mother. It was the first I had heard of a guitar. My mother verged on the tone deaf, but being reluctant to admit ignorance, I replied rather cleverly, she's thinking about it. I had learnt to become adept at covering up. Subsequently, it emerged that my infant sister, mispronunciation, was to blame. On her school, her school run, what she had actually let slip was the rather less outre news that my mother had Qatar. <laughs> Inf <laughs> information which I feel was willfully misheard and mangled to suit Petswood darker ends. No doubt this particular round of Chinese whispers ended by putting it about that my mother was about to join the Rolling Stones and appear on Ready, Steady, Go. <laughs> Thank you. But so anyway, the real reason that I wrote this book is, is to defend my poor mother who, who died 
nine years ago, this weekend, in fact, whose life was tainted and ruined by divorce. And I think that was the case for many women of that generation. Um, and, and that's my theme. And that's why, in the end, I felt I had to write this book. Thank you. I wasn't actually going to read from my book. Rupert's luckily brought in a proof copy, but I am going to read one little section because it connects with, with Rupert's book. Um, when I read Rupert's memoir, I did find myself saying, why do I bother writing fiction? And it's actually, it's a very interesting question. Why bother writing fiction when somebody who's prepared to tell honestly and truthfully what happens in their lives gives you the real stuff? unmediated. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, the connection between Rupert's book and, and mine, which struck me when the issue came up of who should share the platform here at Charleston, is inherited emotional scars, I suppose, um, I suppose I should say. Um, I wanted to, when I, in fact, let me just explain. Some of you know that I have been writing a series of books set in Sussex, set not a million miles from here. And these books, this is now the fourth, and in these books I've been tracing the lives of, of Sussex middle-class people like ourselves. And my object in writing this has been to try to reclaim the, um, the dramas, the anxieties, the concerns of, of people like myself, and to a certain extent I hope like you, for um, legitimate fictional interest. And I believe very passionately that that has to be the case, that we can't be left only to write and read stories about people from the subcontinent or the, or the Arctic or people who are of um, a very different class and persuasion and have suffered a great deal more than us just because we haven't been abused in childhood, although perhaps some of you have, I don't know. Um, I, I think we are still, each of us, struggling with our lives. And the essence of my endeavor as a writer is to chart that struggle, to try and make some sense of it, and through the process for me of writing, <clears throat> for me as a reader when I read other books that I read, to know more clearly why that struggle makes sense, what is good and bad w within that struggle. And I think that journey can be charted in one week in a Sussex village in the 21st century as powerfully and emotionally as in anything else. However, these three books that I've written so far have taken my characters from the year 2000 to the year 2010, and they're growing up, my characters. And I found that they had grown up rather more slowly than I was writing, and that I needed to write another book, but I wanted to jump them on a bit, and I didn't have the time to do that. So I thought, I must write something that gives them time, I'll write something else, that gives them time to grow up a few years. Because it's really interesting that, to take characters you meet at the age of 11, re-meet them at the age of 19, re-meet them at the age of 26. You don't, I believe, actually want to trace every single moment of their lives. So what to do? And I decided the answer was to go back into the past of my same characters. How to explain that? How to explain the connection between what I decided would be a novel set in the Second World War and my other books. So I thought somebody, some wise person, maybe Montaigne or maybe Proust, must have said somewhere what I wanted to say, which is that we actually inherit our emotional characteristics as much as our physical ones. And I couldn't find anybody who'd said it to put as an epigraph to the book. So I thought, well, I'll tell you what, I'll write it myself and I'll fake the authorship. And nobody's going to know. I mean, who, who has been through every bit of Proust or Montaigne? If I just bung their names at the end, I'll get away with it. But I was told I couldn't do this. So <laughs> I wrote my own epigraph, and this connects, I think, with Rupert's endeavor. And this is what I wrote, and it's on the first page of, of this book, Motherland. Our parents have loved before us and their parents before them. For all we know, we inherit our ways of loving along with the color of our eyes. The joys we feel have been felt before. The mistakes we make have been made before. We carry within us the hopes and fears of the generations that have formed us. This is the unknown motherland from which we are always escaping and to which we will always helplessly be true. So that's actually by me, but honestly, it could have been by some really famous person, <laughs> couldn't it? 
So with this in mind, I decided to go back in time. I'd already built up a lot of, of characters, and I took one of my characters, who's a young woman called Alice Dickinson, who we've met in my first book, Secret Intensity of Everyday Life, aged 11. She's now aged 24. She's making a mess of her love life. She discovers that her father, who's estranged from her mother, in fact, they would never lived together. She's the child of a single parent. The, this father has, of course, a mother who is still alive. Why wouldn't she be? And living in France. In other words, she has a grandmother that she's never, ever met. And she is confused about her own identity, her own uh, emotional life, and she thinks to herself, there's a whole genetic heritage here about which I know nothing. And she says to her, her father, the estranged father, who she does meet, um, what happened in our family life? And her father says, you come from a long line of mistakes, which is not very cheerful for, for her. Um, so she goes and visits this grandmother, who she's never met, and she says to the grandmother, your son, my father, says, I come from a long line of mistakes. And her father says, that's true. Uh, I've messed up. We've all messed up. But there's one true love story in your heritage. The book then becomes that story. We go back to 1942. And I'm then able to do something I've not done before in my books. My other books, if any of you have read any of them, have a lot of characters in them, and I pride myself on moving from character to character, and each time I'm in the mind of that character, and what you discover is how little the characters know of each other. You, the reader, are in the position of God. Well, I'm God, but you're getting the benefit of God's insight, and that enables you to realize what I believe profoundly to be true, how little we understand each other, how much we mistake each other, how much in our own fears we misinterpret the way people treat us. And it can cause horrible breaches that are not necessary. Anyway, what I decided to do this time, instead of going through about 10 characters dotting back and forth, I would do something I've always wanted to do, which is write a great, socking, big, emotional love story. Now, the great thing about going back into the past to write a love story is there are lots of obstacles. There are no obstacles now. If people fall in love, what's to stop them getting it on, you know? Well, there is a lot to stop them getting on, but it's all their own neurotic incapacity, which isn't very sympathetic. In the past, there were genuine obstacles. So I go back to 1942, and I create a story of which there are many, which is the one girl, two boys story. A lovely young woman who's a virgin, who's never been in love before, but who's very pretty and who has that sense that pretty girls have that at what point do you trade your prettiness for the best advantage, as it were? At what point do you sell? And uh, it's a difficult question because, of course, you want to fall in love and you believe that the right person is out there for you, but a lot of guys are coming on to you. So do you go for him or him or him? You're not going to choose the first because you're getting lots of options. Tricky one. So she's waiting for the coup de foudre. And this happens. It happens very early on. And by the way, it all happens right here. It happens in a village that is invented by me called Edenfield, which is placed geographically where Beddingham is. So Beddingham is like five houses. Edenfield is a full village about the size of Furl which is down the road. And I've borrowed a lot from Furl, actually, um, in all, all my books, um, and also from my home village of, of Barkham. But this is a fictional village. So here in Edenfield, in 1942, the big house and all the farmhouses are full, as I'm sure you know, of Canadians. That's what happened in the South Coast. There were a million Canadians here building up for the eventual push to, uh, into France. Um, these Canadians had nothing to do and they caused quite a lot of trouble, and uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of argument when, went on back home in Canada about why aren't our heroes being allowed to, to go and fight. Um, at the same time, Stalin was agitating for a second front. At the same time, uh, Mountbatten was hanging around with nothing to do. The result of all of these um, circumstances was it was decided to mount an attack on France as a trial run for D-Day, and this was the Dieppe parade. I don't know how many of you know about the Dieppe Parade. They went from New Haven. 6,000 Canadians went, and almost none of them came back. It was an absolute disaster. And I've always wanted to write about the Dieppe Parade. So I thought, I want to write a love story. I want to write about the Dieppe Parade. And I want to do something else. I want to explore 
whether it's possible, and I have a personal interest in this, whether it's possible for a good guy, a good man, a person of, of decency and perhaps not a great deal of sexy power, sort of like me, to get the girl in the end. Because, you know, in my experience growing up, girls like bad boys. I was not a bad boy. I was a good boy. I was a dutiful boy. And, you know, this was a real problem to me. Uh, my only solution, by the way, just in passing, that uh, to get the girls was I thought if I asked them an enormous number of questions about themselves, they'd end up being so fascinated by my interest in them that they might love me. And uh, so I did that a lot, which, gave, which developed an enormous amount of knowledge on my part about what <laughs> goes on inside women, and eventually a little action. Anyway, I've always been fascinated by the idea of, can the good guy get the girl? And so I set up a classic triangle. My kitty, my heroine, of course falls in love with the bad boy. The bad boy is a commando. He's... He's bad in the sense, by the way, that he hardly ever speaks. He's moody. He's very good looking. He doesn't need her. That's the essence of badness, isn't it? That's what makes you yearn to wrap your arms around him. Good guys like me, hanging around all wet-eyed, wanting, wanting you, if you're a woman, I'm speaking to you. You don't want me. Of course you don't want me, because I'm wanting you too much. Neediness is very off-putting. So, but what can you do? You know, if you're a good guy, you need people. So... Ed, the bad guy, gets the girl. But the good guy, Larry, who's me, as it were, has fallen in love with her. What can he do? Ed's his best friend. So we have the straightforward triangle set up. And I thought, I am going to work this one through to the end. So it lasts about eight years of his longing for Kitty, the things that happened to him, because he makes a lot of mistakes. He realizes she's with Ed. She loves Ed. Ed loves her. They both go on the Dieppe parade. The Dieppe parade is shattering for both of them. It becomes a kind of turning point for both of them. I d I'm not going to tell you the whole plot of the film. But what I do want to say is that the thing that was really driving was two things. I wanted, like in all my writing, to write about what I believe really happens inside men and women when they get into relationships with each other. Now, the kind of book I'm writing has been written many times before, but in the past, nobody talked about the sex. There was just dot, dot, dot at the sex bit. And in the present, nobody wants the love. I want both. I want the sex and I want the love. So there's a lot of sexual detail about, by which I mean the mess, the chaos, the misunderstanding, the, the bad moves, the things that don't work, that you don't... These are all... A lot of these people are virgins, and they're learning their way through sex. So those of you who haven't yet become sexually experienced, if you read this book, it could be very helpful. Um, so I wanted to tell a lot of truth, but I also wanted to explore this concept of the good man. Can the good man ever be a hero? It's actually one of the... the, the there are four parts to the book. The first part is called War, and then Art for reasons that we may get on to, then independence, and then a good man. That's the fifth part. That's the end. Now, the classic exemplar here is, of course, War and Peace and Pierre. Pierre is a good man in War and Peace. I love War and Peace. It is my ultimate book. I love Pierre. A lot of people don't. Andre is the bad guy. He's the guy, Prince Andre, who, of course, Natasha falls in love with. But she gets Pierre in the end. Pierre gets her in the end. And I just love that story. And the book is almost a meditation on can goodness ever be sexy. So I'll stop there, and Rupert and I are going to have a little discussion which may illuminate these things a little bit more. Interestingly, though, in the last pages of War and Peace, you get the distinct impression that neither Pierre nor Natasha are particularly happy. It's not a particularly successful I marriage. totally disagree. <laughs> They're <laughs> having a wonderful time. I think Tolstoy really, really... But what he does is he tells the truth about a domestic situation. He doesn't idealise it, but I think it's a great marriage. Tolstoy, by the end, later on he changed his mind, but when he was writing War and Peace, he really believed that that was a good 
That's how real relationships are. That's my belief. Yes, it's certainly a very real relationship. But Andre's not a bad guy. Well, he's kind of he's me. He's gorgeous. Well, he is good. <laughs> <laughs> he is, he is gorgeous, but, he, but, but there's something in him that's too held back, you know? He's, I mean, Pierre, Pierre is spending his whole time looking for answers in a kind of almost open, naive, just like me. I mean, I absolutely love this, this search for meaning. And by the way, I mean, I don't know why any of you people read novels. We, we, we spoke earlier. Here's Rupert has written The Truth. Here's me telling you a whole lot of lies. And what's more, my lies take about four times as long to read as his truth. So why would you bother with it? And the answer is, I think, because all the time we're trying to find equivalents of our actual experience, this is why I read, equivalence of the truth of our experience that makes us grow, become wiser, know more about other people, um, which I get hugely from your book. Yes, I'm slightly worried that you think this is true. Ah. <laughs> um, it's, it's poetically true, I think. I wouldn't want anyone to take it all as literally true, simply because it is a memoir. It is what I remember, it is what I have been told, and although I have done a certain amount of research, I think if someone was writing a biography of the people in my book, it would probably be very different. And of course, I've already had several letters from people who were there at the time and who said, no, 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 you've misremembered, that didn't happen, you know, or you got some detail wrong. Um, and even in the course of writing the book, I found myself sort of shaping my memories into something which would be artistically acceptable. I think if you write the literal truth, it could get pretty boring. So uh, a number of minor characters have been elided. Um, a lot of detail has been left out, inevitably. I still, st I still stand by every word, but... I wouldn't quite say it was literally the truth. I, I understand that because, of course, any... It is an artefact. Well, it becomes an artefact. Any partial version cannot be the truth because it's selected. Yeah. And, and that I know from the work that I do when I do, like I do film work on people's lives. And people say, is it true? And I say, I've tried to make it represent the character truthfully, but it's not true and it can't be because when you select material, you leave stuff out, mm. uh, 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 of course. But you, um, when you wrote that, you were being true to your own feelings yes. about exactly. what it has done yes, to, you. to you. Yes, that's, it's, my, it's and, my truth. And, but, but that's what is powerful. What's powerful, mm. I mean, if you read this book, it's a very painful book, I have to say. Um, uh, and the, the pain, which Rupert never speaks about openly, but you feel it all the time, is Rupert's pain. Although you talk about your mother's and you're writing about your mother's, which is horrifying. I mean, I, I hadn't realised at all, and my parents split up um, a little bit later than this, I hadn't realised the, the, the situation, even in the 60s, of a divorced person. I, I, the, I didn't know how recently it was taboo um, and impossible. But the feeling I get as I read it all the time, I'm imagining myself being you and thinking, what did this do to Rupert? You know? What did it do to you? <laughs> well, I suppose the difficulty for me, because I never met my father again, is I feel there's a whole dark side of my personality which I have no access to. You know, there's 50% of my genes come from him, and I ha have no real way of knowing which aspects of my behaviour are determined by that 50%. Um, perhaps the most extraordinary little story which m I might tell you is that um, the photograph on the cover of this book um, was taken um, by a photographer from my father's newspaper office uh, on the very day that he, he told my mother that he was leaving. Um, he invited the photographer down to take these photographs because he said he wanted something to remember us by. So he must have known at some level that he was never going to come back. Um, and that's, you can't really see, but that's me on the front there with my head in my hands. And I was four at the time. And I have this very, very vivid memory of 
watching the tele of, of this tea party and this photographer appearing, taking these photographs, and watching the television, and it was a Sunday afternoon classic serial on the television, and there was a, a young man on it wearing black tights, and it was, it was sort of set during the Wars of the Roses or some period like that, in black tights and a tunic, and one of those funny sort of black medieval hats. And I remember thinking, I, I love you. <laughs> I'm completely in love with you. You're absolutely gorgeous. I adore you. Um, and I've always assumed that this was a false memory. I couldn't... Po how could I possibly remember this? But I did a little bit of research um, and looked through some old editions of the uh, Radio Times for 19 summer of 1959, because I knew that was roughly when my father left. Um, and uh, I did discover that there was a series called The Golden Spur by Constance Cox, which featured the young Oliver Reed, would you believe? <laughs> As, um, and I think, what, I think what must have happened, I mean, and if I ever met Dr. Siegmund Freud, I'd like to discuss this with him, is that I must have realised that my father was leaving at that point and transferred my love for him onto Oliver Reed <laughs> on the television. And there it sort of has remained ever since. So that's one thing it does to you. I mean, you, you couldn't make it up, could you? You I couldn't mean, if, make if, it up. <laughs> and I thought I had made it up. <laughs> Why do I bother? Except, except, of course, I mean, because, you know, Rupert has been gay for, you know, for ever since. Yeah? Yes, Sophia, Sophia. Just in case any of you didn't know, just to clarify that. <laughs> So it all happened there at that point. So it's all done by trauma. That's what I now think. <laughs> so it's an interesting question. But here's the thing. Whenever, when I hear you telling a story like that, my immediate thought is I can get that into a book. And I'm stealing all the time from... I mean, any of you who, who know me and take me aside and tell me stories, watch out. Because as with all writers, we do steal these things and insert them into our own stories. So in a strange way, fiction isn't fiction. It's a kind of collection of all the stuff that we've learned. Well, and equally, I think the other way around, I think memoir, you turn it into an, you know, well, inevitably one turns one's life into a story. Mm. One shapes it into a novel. And, of course, real life doesn't have shape like that on the but whole, But that's does what... It? It's just one damn thing after another. That's exactly what <laughs> books are all about. It's what story, that keyword story, is all about. Um, I came across a quote by, I think it was Colm Toybin, saying, who's a writer who I think is a very fine writer, but he said, I'm not interested in story, I'm not interested in narrative, I'm only interested in creating patterns. Now, I think that is complete balderdash. And I don't think it's what he does. I think all writing is the creation of story. And, and you can do it in a more obvious or, or a less obvious way. But what you're doing is you're forming shapes out of our life. Because our actual life is extremely messy and painful. There's no justice. The bad succeed. The good fail. Everything that you should be given, you have not been given. You you're, haven't got your own desserts. So it's a, it's a tough business to negotiate. When you turn to fiction, I'm not saying it has to have happy endings. I'm not saying it all has to be sweetness and light. But what it has to be is structured. And that structure is what you are seeking in good books. And the reason I find most modern novels drive me nuts is because they've got tremendous pro prose style, but no structure. And, and uh, do you find that? I don't read much modern fiction. Well, fact, there you I have are. To say, <laughs> this wonderful novel, I have to say, is the, <laughs> is the only uh, 20, certainly 21st century novel that I've read this year, I'm ashamed to say, because I find most... Yes, I think from exactly the reasons that you've been saying, I find most modern fiction, there's something very paltry about it. Well, you know, it's a very interesting I truly feel that, in a sense, I'm fighting a, a, a battle to tell stories the way they used to be told. And I don't want... I, mean, I, I think I, you, you mentioned yourself that there was something old-fashioned, uh, you didn't use the, the, the yeah. term, but about the fact that I don't have an unreliable yes. narrator. Yeah. I have a straightforward... Well, I, don't, I mean, the narrator is me, yes. but, but, but the central character yeah. is, is reliable. I'm not attempting to play postmodern games. I think we all went up a terrific blind alley in every art form 
visual, music, and, and literature by trying to essentially create texts for the academy. I think that's where it's all gone wrong. And if you instead, and, and by the way, it's Hollywood that has taught me this, if you create texts for a readership instead, you're in a completely different relationship and you have a completely different um, uh, commitment to tell stories that when you begin reading them, you want to go on to the end. You're not just reading it because you think everybody will think you're stupid if you haven't read it. And I'm afraid I think there's a certain amount of that. Bill, Try. you're a storyteller, but you're also a moralist. Yes. Now, how do you combine the two? How do you get the morality through the story, if you like, without doing sort of finger-wagging, parsonical sermons like George Eliot does at times? Well, I mean, George Eliot I love. Yes, I, mean, I the, love the, her too. The, 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 the tradition that I would wish to be in is the tradition of George Eliot, Ruskin, Tolstoy, Proust. That's, that's the, the lineage. These are all moralists. They're all obviously very, very great. And I'm very, very lecture? tiny. Sometimes, Tolstoy does Sometimes really, they do. Well, he didn't... In the War and Peace. In his great or, books, no. he doesn't. He does yeah. later. They, sometimes they do, and sometimes that's not good. And lecturing isn't good, and how to avoid it is, is the perennial problem. But I think that, in a way, if you say to yourself, I love my characters, and I care about what happens to them, you become a moralist. If instead you say, I'm not interested in my characters, I'm interested in the form of what I'm constructing... Yeah. Or, then what the hell is going on? Mm. How can you be a writer and not be a moralist? I don't get it. Mm. Everything you're writing is about the values by which we live. You, I'm affirming, every, every page you read of mine is affirming my values, whether I want to or not. And, and I, I just don't see how it can be otherwise. But, and by the way, the same is true of this. Everything in this is affirming your compassion and your need not to be treated the way you were treated for your wife. Not there, there, There's a, a covert instruction all the way through, don't behave like this, isn't there? I suppose so. <laughs> That's interesting. I've never, th I've never thought of that, actually, because, as I say, I'm not quite clear what my motives for writing this but book you're were. But you're not Apart approving. Apart from defending, my, defending exactly. my mother, who I feel... Justice was never done. Exactly. To. You're not approving the way your father acted, even though yes. you don't know what pressures were on him. Mm. I mean, when my parents split up, I watched them for years before they split up. And in a way, it formed a lot of my fundamental attitudes. I saw two good people torture each other to death. Mm. And eventually he left, causing enormous pain to my mother. But I could see why he couldn't stand it anymore, mm. because mm. I was a grown-up. Mm. You weren't a grown-up. So if I were to write, as I have written uh, about that, it would be with infinite sympathy for both sides. Well, I suppose that's one thing about the 19th century novel, isn't it? It is a great grey moral area. It is moral, but fundamentally moral. Those writers you mm. mentioned are all moralists, but it's not a sort of black and white morality, is it? Uh, absolutely. The sort of everybody's in the grey area, Pierre and Andre. And that's the, caused by the author being emotionally involved mm. with their characters. Yeah. In the minute you own all your characters, you don't have villains. Everybody's mm. part of you, the author. And uh, this is why I don't... Silly example. I don't like Roald Dahl. I think Roald Dahl writes out of anger. I think it's there's a sort of rage drives the um, energy of, of, of what he that does. That can be very powerful. It, it, well, it is. Yeah. It is. And Philip people, Roth and people love writes it. out of purely but, but negative emotions. I can't stand emotions, it. I can't but it's, stand it. It's, you're gripped by it. You're thrilled you are, by it. I throw it away. <laughs> I, I just don't want, I don't want all that stuff. I feel this is bloody, vain, egotistical person whinging on because life hasn't given him a beautiful body. I mean, come on. <laughs> What fascinates me about Motherland, and I think it's probably true of all your novels, is to the great extent to which the whole thing is driven by dialogue. You are not actually a very overt or very present narrator. Um, presumably this is something... Dialogue is something you got very good at through screenwriting. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, maybe. I'm not aware of it. I mean, people often say when they read my books and they talk partly about the dialogue and partly about the visual presentation of the scenes, like, say, the Dear Parade, which is very... It's very, a showpiece. Very cinematic, yeah. yeah. Or the Indian Independence Riots, which come into the book. They say, oh, I can tell you're a screenwriter, and I want to punch them. Because I want to say, yeah, yeah, and you know what? 
Dickens was a really good screenwriter. Yes. He wrote very visual scenes and he had yes. great dialogue. I mean, I, I think it's not that. It's that a lot of writers nowadays write in a very intellectual fashion and I do not. I try to write from inside the characters and the events all the time, never stopping to say, how can I present myself as an author mm, reflecting on mm. this in a fine way mm, which can mm. be quoted and read out at the Charleston Festival or something like that. Yes. And I just don't do that. And I think that was knocked out of me, actually, by Hollywood. Well, I you're not an true. egocentric novelist. I'm very, in the way uh, that Proust is, I think, you see, that's why Tolstoy for me is, is a greater writer. Than well, he's a, Tolstoy is a more perfect writer, but, yeah. but but Proust is something rather disagreeable about Proust. Well, also, I think I think Proust. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think Proust gets love completely wrong. I don't think Proust gets. Yeah, well, that's it not about a very love. good start, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but he's so infinitely subtle in his understanding of human psychology that I would rather spend you know, a day with Proust than a week with anybody Who would else. you rather be tied to a radiator with? <laughs> Proust or Tolstoy? Think carefully, actually. I love Tolstoy up to about the end of, oh, I don't know, maybe the end of Anna Karenina. He became an absolute pig after that. He would have lectured me about the damned peasants, wouldn't he, after that? Mm. So I, I wouldn't have wanted him after that. Also, similarly with Proust, he became very, very difficult. So I want them when they were in their prime. Yes. I think Proust, uh, Tolstoy's search is, is, it goes on all his life, even yeah. though he does... I'm never quite convinced by his certainties at the end of his life, and I don't think he was either. I know, um, I just love it's him. It's sort of the, sort of the struggle goes on, whereas I think with Proust it was never much of a struggle. He was just an observer. He was outside, you know, he was in that cork-lined room. Yeah, but he observing. had so many neurotic inside. obsessions that were driving him. <clears throat> I find a very attractive way. He's kind of naked in front of you because he may not even realise it, but he's giving himself away all the time, his snobbism, his homosexuality and so forth, about which he's never quite... You a... don't give yourself away, actually. You, 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 you could read one of your novels and not know anything about you at all. Well, it's all me. All the characters are me, including, by the way, the women. And that's... <laughs> That's very important. I spent a lot of my time trying to imagine, for example, what would it be like, 1942, to be a young woman, she's, uh, what is she, she's 19 years old, and uh, she's wearing regulation army knickers, and when the point comes when she's going to actually get into bed with her boyfriend, who she is passionately in love with, assumes will marry her, which he does, so she's not a slut, but she doesn't want him to see her knickers, that's problem number one. And uh, problem number two is she doesn't know what's going to happen when they get into bed together, and she's going to find it out as it goes along. Now, that really interests me. So I have to work it all out, you know, beat by beat, physical moment by physical moment, and I have to become a woman, you know, and I have to acquire a woman's body to think that way through. Now, you may say, A, that's impossible, and B, you have failed. All I can say is read the book, see, see, see what you, you think. Um, but I am very, very keen on doing that empathetic act. Now, that woman, as a woman, is still me. Mm. So it's me as a woman. And actually, there are many kinds but, uh, of women. But don't your characters constantly surprise you? Don't you have that feeling which most novelists have of the whole thing going slightly out of your control? Or do you know exactly where you want it to end when you begin it? I do know where it's going to end when I begin it. I do plan very, very carefully the entire structure. In, in the case of, of, of Motherland, I knew I wanted to take each of my three main characters on a journey, and I knew that journey couldn't just be A to B. There had to be yeah. st way stations along the way. But what's, something very interesting happens, and this is a research thing. When you started writing that, you would have come across extra material which would have twisted what happened. With me, I knew I was going to have the Dieppe raid, I knew I was going to have Indian independence. I, you'll find out why when you, you read the book, if you read the book. But what I also knew was I wanted my good guy, my me guy, my non-sexy good man, who's still yearning after the lovely Kitty, I wanted him to be a guy who had grown up in a family firm and wanted to be an artist. I know from my wife's family, from many people around, this, this tremendous drive of people who want to be artists, they feel it's a more meaningful existence than most others. And I thought to myself, what about a guy who 
does that. He wants to be an artist. He disappoints his family because he says, I will not enter the family firm. I, I am in love with art. He becomes an artist. It doesn't work out. He's just not good enough. And there comes a point when he realizes that. He's by now married, not to the love of his life. Where's he going to get a living? He goes back into the family firm. And then I thought, wouldn't it be really interesting if he discovers as a businessman the fulfillment that he thought he would find in art? Who writes about that? Nobody writes about that. So what business could he be in? And this is how I work as a novelist. So I think, what about my old friend David? My old friend David I was at school with, his family firm was Fife's Bananas. <laughs> Let's have him go into the banana trade. So I ring David up and I say, can I borrow your entire family firm and everything that happened? Because I remembered that when we were at school together, David's father died. And uh, so David was young. His father was 42 when he died. He died because... He was the fourth generation to run Fife's Bananas. It was taken over, this is true, it was taken over by United Fruit. United Fruit, which is the great octopus that created the original banana um, empires in, in the, uh, the southern the South America. Monstrous, horrific company. They took him away from his desk for training in Boston. While he was away, they emptied his office, took everything out, put a new person in, and then they said, by the way, you're sacked. And he came home and had a heart attack and died. And I thought, that's really interesting. He loved his firm so much, it was like taking him from his family. And that fir Fife's, the true Fife's, was actually a wonderful firm. Now, I didn't make any of that up, but I've piled it all into the novel, and it's given me the opportunity to explore this whole thing about a good man running a company in a bad world. So all the time, I'm kind of choosing moral dramas effectively, but I'm feeding it with real stuff from the world around me, which is what you're doing. And what is the, the role of imagination in all this? I mean, do you sometimes worry that your novel could end up too freighted with fact? Yes. And not lift, sort of yes. uninflated yes. by the reality of the imagination, as it were. But it's not the reality of the imagination that lifts it up. There sort of isn't any imagination, actually, because anything I can imagine is only something I've remembered or met or found. I can't make anything up. I can add things together in mm. new ways. I that can give wings to a I pig, but I've up. seen wings and I've seen pigs, mm. you know. So that's what people call imagination. Don't you wish you could make something up? I'd love to make something up. But by definition, it wouldn't exist if it came from nowhere and didn't connect with anything. What you do instead, the way you lift the great mass of facts, and this applies to what you do and all the people we've heard at the Charleston Festival, the way you lift up a factual story is through the emotion of the characters. If you invest in the emotion of the characters as a reader, the facts trot along behind, then it works fine. If you're telling people to care because of the facts, it ain't going to work. Don't you what think? about, I'm not sure, what about the great romantic poets? Poetry is completely different. It really is. I mean, we're talking about creating a sustained alternative reality when we write a, a, mm. a, a book. Mm. But a poem really is a completely mm. different mm. different matter. If I was to write about it, I actually am writing now about Emily Dickinson. I'm writing a novel. It's in the same series, believe it or not, but Emily Dickinson gets in. And I, I'm imagining being Emily Dickinson, um, who is a poet I absolutely love. It's just an excuse to get a lot of her poems into a book. Because I find nobody's heard of Emily Dickinson. Mm. Oh, they have. Of course have they? they have. Everybody yes, here heard of Emily yes, Dickinson? Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Have you all read her? Yes. Did you know that her brother, her 55-year-old brother, pillar of the community, fell in love with a 24-year-old wife of another professor in Amherst, Massachusetts, and had mm. sex in Emily Dickinson's dining room? <laughs> you did not. <laughs> With Emily Dickinson guarding the door. Isn't that amazing? It's all going to be in one novel I'm writing. Come here. <laughs> well, Bill, all this is very, very useful to me because, uh, <laughs> in fact, you're, you're giving me a master class. You don't know this because um, I have been trying to write a novel and failing dismally. I uh, did a lot of research on it. I thought I had a marvellous subject. I've never tried to write fiction before. I've written 30,000 words. I put it aside for a month 
and then went back to read it, and I thought actually it's just it's just not very good. So I put have it been in wrong. the back you may drawer. Have been wrong. I put it deep in the hard drive. You see, here's a problem. We um, heard we it heard it doesn't. Inv- it's got no air in it. Well, we heard it's Mark all Haddon, research, didn't all we, fact. saying that he'd got three quarters of the way through a novel and then had realised it hadn't worked and had chucked it away, which amazed me. But what I want to say about that is, all of us writers, or indeed everybody in whatever field you're in, we live with two goblins on our shoulders. One is the one that whispers in your ear saying, you're a genius. (laughs) And the other one that whispers in your ear, everything you do is shit. (laughs) You know? And it's a matter of what you listen to, how far you can keep going. And the way to shut up the bad goblin and keep the good goblin speaking, is to say to the bad goblin, yes, I know, I know, everything I do is no good, but I'm not doing the real thing yet. This is just work in progress. It'll get better. Give me a chance. And with your book, give yourself a chance. Go back to it and stop thinking it's got to be perfect. You know, and Uh, maybe... Nothing to do with perfection. In my case, I just think I haven't got the, the imagination... I'm interested you say that you don't think you need imagination to write a novel. Mm. I just cannot sufficiently imagine what I'm writing about. I think all that means is you haven't yet got to the point where you are caring enough about what you want to write. Once you start really wanting to get it out there, it comes. Oh, God, on that note. (laughs) (laughs) Questions? There's a question here. We're managing this ourselves, so we're going to try and point through the... Uh, Rupert, I just wonder how your sister reacted to your decision to write the memoir. You see, that's a very... how did she receive the finished text? Very, very good question. Well, I think I'm very, very lucky in that I'm very close to my sister... And um, she gave me absolute carte blanche and said, you must write your book. It's your book. Uh, And she, of course, was the first person to read it. And I was very, very worried about what she might think because she absolutely adored my mother in a very, very uncomplicated way, whereas my, certainly my adult relationship with her was much more conflicted. Um, And she she just said, well, you know, it's, it's your... If that's your story. If I was writing the book, it would be very, very different. But I accept this as, as your story. But you're absolutely right. She is the most... To, to me, what she thinks of this book is the most important thing because she was, she was there. Another one. This one here. Um, if it's not too painful, Rupert, can I ask um, whether you or your sister ever tried to get in touch with your father, perhaps as adults, to get his side of the story? No, Talking you see, that's it's the very, balance that, uh, very interesting described. that we didn't at all. And do you know what the explanation, I think, is? I think I was embarrassed. By the time I was a teenager, I just thought, oh, what on earth do I do? I can't ring him up. My mother did say to me, if you want to go and see him, that's fine by me. And I don't think she really meant that, but she did very bravely say it. But I just thought, what would I say? Hello. Uh, There was an awful moment when he died and we decided we couldn't go to the funeral. And my mother said, I think you'd better send some flowers. And so I went along to Interflora, to the florist, and ordered some flowers. And then I thought, I don't know what to put on the card. I don't know even what to call him. Do I call him Dad? Do I call him Daddy? Do I call him my father? I didn't even have a name for him. Um, But I think the reason in my teenage years I never got in touch was just because I I just didn't know what to say. I hadn't seen him since I was four. It would have been an excruciatingly embarrassing encounter. There would be nothing to be gained. So part of me thinks maybe the fact that I spent all my life with my mother was was the better you know, the better option. I don't know. Another question? Anybody got the hand up? Well, while you're pondering that, if I can just throw in a little... Oh, no, we do, we do. This is a question for you. Thank you. Um, there's a word I think you never use in Motherland, which is depression. 
Have you read it? Yes. Oh, how wonderful. And one... <laughs> My reader. <laughs> and one character, of course, is a martyr to that. And I wonder whether this was a decision on your part that historically it would have been wrong to use what is almost now, well, it's, it's a cliche of science and emotion and everything else. But everything is down to depression. And we know what to do about that. We take a pill, and lots of them. But would you like to talk about that? Yes, um, yes. one of the characters, I, I, I won't go into too much detail, is indeed uh, suffers from, from depression. I mean, he calls it the darkness, and mm. going into the darkness. He has a a terrible fear that at a certain point he will disappear into the darkness. Um, it's, but what you say is quite correct. I, I didn't call it depression because I do think that's a more modern way of thinking. Um, I, I think uh, you know people, of course, way back talked about melancholia. But also but, depression possibly is clinical, Yes. whereas his relates to this very specific trauma, presumably. Uh, well, that's true, but I think I do suggest that he's that way but from anyway, the beginning. Yes. He was that way was at school, mm. you know, that he had that kind of way of being in him. Um, also, I didn't, but I didn't want to clinicalize it. I wanted the, it to be his character, not his diagnosis. Um, and so, but I was very interested in that. I mean, I, my my, um, my mother is is a depressive, um, manic depressive, and I've lived with this. She's still alive um, all my life, and watched it, and know quite a lot about it. And my mother indeed has pills, as as people do nowadays. They they wouldn't have done then, um, and they didn't understand what was happening then. But you know, even though we now understand so much more about it, a part of me still thinks depression is a legitimate response to terrible circumstances. Mm. Um, and in the case of my character, my feeling is he's that way because his life has made him that way, not because his brain is wired wrongly. I may be quite wrong about this. It's a very big subject. Um, but that's why I think I wanted to do it as in character terms, not in medical terms. Did you like the book? Oh, she's not sure. No, no, it's not true. That's not, I'm not sure. Um, it is a very, very ambitious. Tries talk, hard. Yes, talking about life. And of course, ever so often I say, yes, you've hit the target. And nobody else has said this quite before. Yes. And I was very, very glad. Other times, for instance, Kitty and singing. Yes. That's a great moment when yes. she sings. Yes. And it's a great moment for her. But nothing else comes of it. And if it mattered that much to her, she'd have, she'd have sung again. Yeah, you, you should have spoken to me before I finished the book. I <laughs> could have corrected that mistake. <laughs> it is a big, ambitious book. Uh, do, uh, any other questions? Yes, here. No. Two things for you, Rupert. Um, one, we were talking about the stigma of divorce in the 50s and 60s. And you were saying how this would have affected your mother to a certain extent, and probably to a large extent. All young children wish to, most young children wish to conform. The one thing I remember at school was desperately not wanting to stand out. So first of all, how did, you, how did this affect you personally and your sister when you were going through your school days? Could this possibly, years later, be one of the reasons why maybe you're not confident enough, confident enough, despite your successful career so far, certainly as a journalist, as a critic, um, to complete your novel? Is there a lack of confidence mm. involved in that? And possibly does this go back Strange. to this trauma you had during your school days? God. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's very interesting. Very interesting, very interesting question. I mean, at the time, I mean, as I say, I was four when I last saw my father. I think I dealt with the whole thing in the way that very small children do. I think small children are very resilient to these sorts of emotional shocks. And I think I just sort of shut down. I shut him off. I shut all memory, I, I mean, I can remember very, very little about him, almost nothing, just the odd stray memory. I cannot remember any grief or any anxiety um, attached to him, but I must have had it between the ages of four, five, six and seven. But I, it's as though I have buried him and pulled a slab of, uh, you know, very, very thick marble over his tomb, and that's how, that's how I coped. My sister coped 
by telling everybody that he was dead, literally, that she'd, all, her, all her friends thought he was dead. Um, I don't think I, I don't think I do have an enormous amount of confidence, but I don't think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, fun I'm fully functional as far as. <laughs> as, <laughs> as far as I know, I certainly don't. I'm very, very concerned. I don't want people to think this is a misery memoir or that I'm presenting myself as a victim, in a sense. It's, I, w I, want, I want people to read about them. I think my mother was the victim. My father sort of got away and made a, a, a second marriage of sorts. My mother met this wonderful man um, in, the, in the 1960s, and they fell deeply in love. But she, didn't fee she was the one who lacked the confidence to marry him and go and, go and live in America, which, of course, my sister and I would have been thrilled. <laughs> Um, to do, and that I think is her great tragedy, and she ended up her life very embittered, really, and I think feeling very, very cheated. She is the victim, not me. Do we have one more question? Before we get this one here. Um, when, when embarking on a sort of autobiographical work, how important is it that the main characters are already dead? I think it's hugely important. I mean, my mother, as I said, died nine years ago this week, at this very weekend, because I was actually down at the Charleston Festival the night that she died. Um, and um, no, I, uh, it's, so it's taken me, so it took me sort of almost a biblical seven years um, of, uh, uh, of her being dead before, and my feeling that she, she had sort of properly, her spirit was quiet, if you like. Um, before um, I could undertake. And I don't know how people like Lynn Barber um, could write her very, very good memoir um, of her um, teenage years when her parents were still alive, even though they were, I think, in, in, um, they were de demented. But that's not the point. So I think it is very important to have that gap of time. And there's, I, sp I think a lot of... A lot of thought about you can only really begin to see your parents in perspective when they're dead. You know something that struck me very much when I got to the end of your book? We've been talking about artifice and structure yeah. and storytelling, but actually, one of the very powerful feelings I had at the end was you do not claim to have understood everything, no. to have reached any conclusion, no. to have tied things up. And I, th that's how life mm. really is. Mm. We, we, however hard we try, we, we never understand anything. And I think this endeavor of, of writing and, and reading books is all a, a little bit of progress along the way out yeah, of the boundless ignorance. Only. But it never gets to some hallowed no, place where we know Absolutely everything. right. And of course, you end up, actually, it ends up, for me, it sort of raised more questions than it's answered, actually. And I think good books mm. uh, have to do that. Mm. I think that's a good moment to yes. stop, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I, I'd really, um, I think, on, probably, hopefully, on behalf of us all, really like to extend a huge vote of thanks, firstly, to Rupert for his courage in discussing clearly you know, a period. Um, that was, you know, hugely painful and very raw, but 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 beautiful and poignant at the same time. And um, you know, I will take away that sort of misremembering of his memoir and 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 that it's a poetical truth. I think. And and and, but this evening has also been, I for me, very very thought provoking, not least on the blurring between fact and fiction and. As I said, a misremembered memoir and a somewhat fact-based uh, fiction, if that's fair, Bill. And I'd like to thank Bill, too, for, for his honesty and openness and, and uh, absolutely fascinating and actually a hugely wide-ranging, more wide-ranging even than I, I had expected um, debate. So um, huge thanks to you both for a, a warm and poignant and beautiful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.